brings all the profanity we'll have to refrain from using during Thanksgiving dinner. This week's episode is brought to you by Honey and by Vulgarity for Charity. If you're listening to this episode the day it releases, there's still time to get your donation and your roast request in. We're right on the verge of $300,000, which was our goal. We could really use your help pushing us over the top. Check the show notes for details. And now, The Scathing Atheist. From Madison Cawthorn's Western North Carolina, I'm John Badger, the creator of Universe 25, an audio drama for skeptics and atheists. And I can indeed confirm that we have evolved from filthy monkey people. I mean, look at my representatives. We haven't evolved that much. It's Thursday. It's November 24th. And it's Thanksgiving! That's right, a time for family, food, and yelling, Look at the data, you ignorant piece of shit! You have to leave. (laughs) I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Martha Stewart's New Jersey, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, you'll hear the headlines we missed because theocratic bullshit never goes bad. We're recording this early, so Twitter is both alive and dead, like a cat (laughs) in a box of uranium. And Tom and Cecil will be back because all the insults couldn't fit into a single segment. But first, the diatribe. Ah, yes, it's that time of year again. The time of year where Americans celebrate Thanksgiving while international listeners sigh and think to themselves, bet all the headlines are going to be out of date this week. So with apologies once more to the audience beyond our national borders, especially the ones north of us who got like zero mention of their Kmart version of Thanksgiving last month, I must once again talk about our weird ass holiday. A holiday we celebrate by not strangling our racist uncles and our family members reward us with pie. It's a holiday about thankfulness, togetherness, and family, which we commemorate through thankless arguments with our relatives. And it's telling, isn't it, that in a day all about coming together, the thing that will most divide us as a nation will be religion, right? That's not exactly a bold prediction there. Many of you, in fact, won't even be at the big family feast because you don't share the family's preferred God. Some of you are missing it voluntarily. Some of you aren't. And some of you are just wishing with every fiber of your being that you could be missing it. Of course, to be fair, religion isn't the only thing that's going to keep us apart or internally divided this holiday season. Politics will do it, too. So will bigotry. But let's face it, at this point, even distinguishing between religion, politics and bigotry has drawn a fine fucking line. I mean, sure, there are liberal Christians who probably share most of my political views. But generally speaking, those aren't the ones starting fights about Jesus at Thanksgiving dinner. Right at this point, the religious and political identity of most evangelical Americans have all but fused into a single thing. And the central core of it, the adhesive that holds it all together, is bigotry. Right. What is it but permission to hate LGBTQ people, permission to cling to sexism, permission to continue to believe that America's wealth and prominence comes from some inherent superiority rather than slavery and oppression? And when I talk about the lines between religion and politics fading, I don't just mean the demographics line up. Given the unquestioning allegiance, disprovable claims and revisionist history that undergirds MAGA Republicans, it's hard to say that it isn't a religion at this point. And and even if you want to quibble with that distinction, you have to admit that the goals of this political movement are religious. Their goal is to weave their religious doctrines into the fabric of our national government such that it'll be impossible to tease them out without the whole thing unraveling. Religion divides us. It divides us on the small scale in terms of our family. It divides us on the national scale in terms of our politics. It divides us on the international level in terms of our wars. But again, that's not a side effect, right? That's what religion does. That's the evolutionary advantage that it offers. It divides us from them. And it does so so effectively that we won't mind taking their shit when the going gets tough. Anthropology is, generally speaking, really kind in the way that they phrase it, right? They talk about the growth of religion as a way of unifying a tribe. And in a sense, that's true, but it's only unifying it to the degree that there's some other religion out there. 
right? Like if we all shared the same beliefs, it wouldn't even be meaningful to talk about the unifying aspects of religion. We'd be no more unified than a train full of Manhattan commuters that can all agree this is the end train, right? There can't be an in group until there's an out group. And that's what religion provides. It may provide an us, sure, but the survival advantage that it infers is in providing a them. I mean, consider vulgarity for charity, right? Here we are, a, a group of people that are unified by our lack of religious belief. I mean, we're also unified by our appreciation for a finely aged poop joke, of course. But by and large, the defining characteristic of our community is atheist. And sure, that provides an us and a them, right? But only semantically. To wit, not a goddamn person in the entire history of vulgarity for charity in the years that we've been doing this has ever told us that we should make sure that the money goes to atheists. Nobody's ever asked what the religion of the people that they were helping was, right? Or how we were going to use these charitable donations to further atheism. Hell, the people getting the help never even know it was a group of atheists that gave it to them. We have enough us to bring us together, but not enough them to push people away. There's a weird trap that you fall into when you're pushing back against a divisive thing because you have to be against againstness to get there, right? It's like the so-called tolerance paradox. If a society is tolerant to everyone, it must necessarily be tolerant of the intolerant and thus cannot exist. But that's an illusory paradox, right? If a society is tolerant to everyone, there are no intolerant people by definition, right? So we strive instead for a society that values tolerance and suddenly the paradox disappears. In the same way, atheism can unite without turning us against religious people. And to some degree, we can be an us without a them. And you see that with vulgarity for charity, right? But you also see it across millions of tables this year as we sit down to Thanksgiving dinner or as we get up. You see it when the argument with Uncle Larry ends with, you know, you helping him to his car and the fight with Aunt Kathy ends with her reluctantly agreeing to get her goddamn COVID booster. And the ongoing war with your brother-in-law ends with you making a bed for him on your couch. You know, it's really easy on days when we're thrust together with our shitty families to forget the point of all this. You're sure, we're, we're all here to support one another. That's in the nature of community, but our community is here to help them. They are the victims of religion that first spurred us into action. And as hard as it might be to do sometimes, we need to remember to thank them for that. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight, I'm nobody this time. Because we're taking a week off for Thanksgiving. But have no fear, that doesn't mean you don't get headlines this week. Over the last couple of months, we've been stashing extra headlines for exactly this occasion. And other than the fact that it's a little bit out of date and there, there'll be parts where Marsh suddenly appears and disappears between headlines, you'll hardly notice a difference. But first, a word from this week's sponsor, Honey. Today's episode is sponsored by PayPal Honey, the easy way to save when you're shopping on your iPhone or computer. Hey, Noah, get in here. I need your help buying gifts for Heath and Eli online. But di didn't we intercept their letters to Santa? Yeah, but Heath just has very specific dollar amounts. And this is the only thing Eli had on his list that both exist and can be legally shipped inside the U.S. But it's out of our budget. Well, have you tried Honey? I am trying, Dollface. No, no. Honey, honey. It's the free shipping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it can find to your cart. Thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Well, that sounds great. How does it work? Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. That's literally stage direction you wrote at the top of the sand. Yep, it sure is. So when you check out, the Honey button appears and all you have to do is click apply coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. If Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. Okay, but how often does it actually find stuff? You'd be surprised. I, I know I always am. Honey has saved me hundreds of dollars this year on retro game stuff, and I saved over $70 Christmas shopping online with it just this week. But does it get better? It sure does get better. You can save even more when you ask Honey to keep track of price drops on your holiday shopping list. If the price drops on anything on your list, you'll instantly get an alert to let you know. So install it quick before Cyber Monday. All right, I'm sold. How do I sign up? If you don't already have Honey, you could be missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a favor and supporting the show. I'd never recommend something that I don't use. Get PayPal Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash scathing. That's joinhoney.com slash scathing. Awesome. Hey, do you think Honey can save us money on a check for $416.22 for Heath? Yeah, probably not, no. Uh, uh, it found a coupon for 10% off. Weird. And now, back to headlines from the past, already in progress. 
And in Agree to Shoot on Three News, I have been slanderously and bingo loquaciously accused what? from time to time. I needed a second word and I didn't know another big one <laughs> of <laughs> encouraging violence on this podcast. I like that you tried to get a big word and you were like, bingo. Nope, still not there. <laughs> Definitely to stop bingo. Right bingo right really away. That's weird. See my brain trying I'm typing to work. all of this. Yeah. <laughs> I typed it. And then the squiggle man was like, that's not a word. And I was like, yes, it is. Add to dictionary. Fuck you. I lied to Google Docs. Google Docs right now is back home being like, I don't think bingo plug questions is a word. I think this guy's gaslighting us. I'm not actually going to add it to the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> yes, whether I'm gently reciting fun facts like the bombing of Dresden is what changed the most Nazi minds about being Nazis or or Mitch McConnell's home mm. address. There's an army of beeps and lawyers <laughs> jumping in the way. And with stories like this week's, I wonder why, because over on the right wing Catholic website, Church Militant, Michael Voris is just straight up calling for violence like like courtroom bar exam definitions of a call to violence. And he's doing it all while looking like Sloth got a makeover from the Queer Eye guys. It's very <laughs> so he's, yeah. How dare we insist that you be a better human than professional child rape apologist Michael Voris and his SPLC <laughs> listed hate group website. No, if you're going to hold people to impossible standards, it's on you when they fail to meet them. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Marsh. Also, quick detail, um, crazy Nazi, current Nazis, like far-right Nazi sympathizers in Germany, they call the bombing of Dresden Dresden's Holocaust of Bombs in their literature. <laughs> really? Seriously. Mm. That's awesome. Okay. Is it? So here's the quote. Here's the quote. Quote, let's be clear about this for all the phony or delusional pacifists out there. Violence in and of itself is not immoral. It depends on the circumstances. And sometimes even it's necessary. Now, see if you can see which of his violence explanations doesn't belong in his little list that's about to come up. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Self-defense. The subduing of an aggressor threatening the life of your family. Mm. The son of God in the temple violently whipping the money changer. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm tempted by answer B. I got to be honest. Michael Forrest does not have a family or loved ones. That's That doesn't make any sense. But I am going to go with C. Jesus with a whip beating up the evil money changers, which, by the way, is photoshopped in Michael Forrest's graphic to have the face of Chuck Schumer. The New York money changer <laughs> holding a literal bag of gold in the graphic. That's seriously what he puts oh, up on the screen wow. when he talks about this. Yep. Oh. He concludes, and he actually outdoes himself because he concludes, the idea that violence must always at all times always be avoided is not Catholic. Remember the Crusades? What? Sometimes violence must be unleashed to protect the innocent. What? And what? Real quote. So, so wait, so his example of justified violence, to be clear, was the Crusades? <laughs> Jesus Christ. That, like, so seriously, that is not better than, and what about all them kids that needed raping in the 60s and 70s? <laughs> no, right? demonstrably Jeez, worse. No, I, uh, demonstrably worse. What's good justified violence? Bingo, Splunk. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Crusades. The bingo cost. <laughs> so, yeah. Podcast listener, next time you hear an elongated beep on our show or... A joke I'm making comes to an awkward stop. Just remember that I'm just trying to protect the innocent. Just like the Crusades. <laughs> <laughs> and in lies, damn lies, and statistics news, Christian Wright pundit Matt Walsh of The Daily Wire presented all three of those at the same time this week. It's three <laughs> different things in that saying, but Walsh found a way to smush them all together. He appeared on The Joe Rogan Show on Monday. Mm. For a discussion of trans issues, because, you know, it's really important to give enormous platforms to cishet incels when it comes to those topics. And he started just making up numbers about puberty blocker treatment, at which point Joe Rogan, Joseph Rogan, had to be the voice of reason <laughs> and correct the very obvious lying. Okay, it was actually Rogan's producer who did the correcting. But either way, if anyone involved in The Joe Rogan Show had to be the voice of reason about anything other than fucking kick punching. You should <laughs> shut the fuck up forever about whatever you're talking about. 
Well, it's, but in Joe Rogan's defense, how could they possibly have known that Matt Walsh wouldn't be a reliable source of unbiased information about the trans community. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if we don't unskeptically interview bigots for 11 hours at a time, how can they mainstream their views? Yeah, yeah. Th these are great questions. Important. So Walsh was talking about his anti-trans bigot movie called Who the Fuck Cares? And the conversation <laughs> turned to the use of hormone blockers. When kids express that their gender assignment at birth doesn't match their identity... That treatment can delay the permanent effects of puberty when that can be helpful. Well, somehow, Matt Walsh has a big stake in that medical issue. And he seems to think there's a grand conspiracy by the medical community to make huge profits from this. So after hearing Walsh make that claim, Rogan asked, how many people have used the treatment you're talking about? And Walsh responded, exact quote, depends on what, I, I don't think we have exact, numbers but it's I, if we're talking about the drugs it's i mean millions spoiler it's, <laughs> it's not fucking millions no nope. not that it's a problem if it was but it's not even close to mm. millions well you said keep in mind that he just made a fucking movie about this <laughs> Yeah. Right. Like, I don't expect the average bigot on the street to know the number here, but he's promoting the movie he just made and he can't even get it like within a couple orders of magnitude of the right answer. No, no, no he cannot. <laughs> I, I do understand the fear, though. Right. If there were millions of trans people, one of them might be brave enough to. Sh All right. There's a weird beep for a second. I got you guys back. So here's the rest of that exchange. Walsh had to think of a big number off the top of his head for his lie. He very slowly sputtered out millions after way bajillion. too long. Trying to come at, but you don't say bajillion, million. And then Rogan said, millions? Really? Thus marking the absolute peak of Joe Rogan's skeptical career. <laughs> and that's when Walsh looked around the room and was reminded, okay, his microphones and broadcast equipment, I better start fucking backpedaling. He said, <laughs> I'm sure someone's going to fact check me on the million number I just said, but my guess is that we're into the millions at this point. And that's when Joe Rogan's producer, Jamie Vernon, jumped in from the booth and said, yeah, I went ahead and did a two second Google. The number is 4,780 children in the last five years in the U.S. Not wow, even close to millions. I mean, Christ. to be fair, Walsh is usually wrong about things like hell and the afterlife, and that's to the infinite power. So this is pretty good for him. Oh no, that's right? fair. That's fair. <laughs> but holy fuck, does that underscore just what a shadow they're hiding from in the first place, doesn't it? Right, because this is a national, like that's like dying from your chair tipping over type numbers, right? <laughs> and a national panic over chair stability would be hilariously stupid, even though that actually <laughs> leads to dying, right? Like that's yeah. actually dangerous. But we'd still say, "Oh, come the fuck on." The struggle's real. Some people live alone. So <laughs> after getting fact-checked by Joseph Q. Rogan, Matt Walsh said, okay, but part of the problem, though, is that we don't, it's, yeah, it's very hard to get numbers on any of this stuff. And, you know, who are you going to trust when they're telling you the numbers? That was his response after trying to tell us the numbers. Yeah, just right. Yes, exactly. Wrong. <laughs> Just for the record, I tried to Google even a bad source to back up Walsh's made-up nonsense number, and I couldn't even find another second liar to support his lie. On the internet, I couldn't find that. But again, it's all irrelevant. The number's the number, and if doctors are recommending something based on data and people are choosing to do it, that's the end of the fucking conversation. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, dude, like as hard as the it's hard to find good numbers after somebody just found good numbers in two seconds argument is to make, it's all the harder when you deploy it in an active effort to make the real numbers harder to find. <laughs> <laughs> and in no more principles news tonight, a school district in Pennsylvania decided that their bigotry is more important than their students, again, more this time it came in the form of literally turning down a no-strings-attached financial donation because, and only because, that donation came from Satanists. Wow. Specifically, the Satanic Temple of Philadelphia in eastern Pennsylvania offered to donate $578 to the district, but were turned down because, presumably, their money was tainted by the sulfurous odor of the horned one. Horned one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Because if there's anything Pennsylvania schools have, it's an abundance of funding. Too much right? funding, really. They've had complaints. Your money's no good here. We're a Christian lunch counter slash public school in 2022. What yep. the fuck is happening? <laughs> yeah. So now this saga actually starts a bit earlier when the Satanic Temple rented space in a local school for a back to the school fundraiser. Uh, this is something the school was legally obligated to allow them to do since they already rent space to churches and other religious organizations. But legal requirements and fair play be damned, Christians, predictably, protested the fuck out of the event. Speaking to a local Fox affiliate at the time, John Ritchie of the pompously titled American Society for the Defense of Tradition, Family and Property accidentally echoed our exact talking points when he said, quote, they're giving them access to our children. They should be nowhere near any schools. And as if to emphasize that he did not, in fact, hear it, he added, quote, we are here to say that America is one nation under God. We don't want Satanism in our schools and we need to do something about it. End quote. OK, hate to break it to you, Christian idiots running that school. But the tax money you get is lousy with Muslim dollars and mm -hmm. <laughs> heels of bucks and Jew gold. <laughs> it's all in there. Yeah. Yeah. And just to be clear. They've already done the thing, right? So now they're just refusing the only benefit that might have come from that situation, right? They had to let the Satanists into their little fair. Everybody protested them and acted like a crazy person outside. The only good that could come from it is his $578. And they're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like statistically, you're taking a lot more atheist tax money than Christian money. So I don't know. Feel free to start heating the building with your fire of faith or whatever. I, <laughs> or yeah, there you go. Throwing ideas out there. So now, despite the community's vitriol, part of the back to the school event was a fundraiser for the district that raised a modest but still helpful $578. But when the Satanic Temple tried to pass this along to the district, they were just told no. They were encouraged to give it to a Christian charity. Gross. Yeah. Superintendent Steve Kirkpatrick responded with a letter that read in part, quote, I respectfully decline your offer of a directed donation to the school district and suggest that you instead send your donation to New Hope Ministries or another local social service organization, end quote. Get the fuck out of here. I did especially enjoy the response letter from the temple when this happened. It explained, hey, if it helps, we can launder the evil self-retainted money into, for example... 22,800 sheets of construction paper or 10,894 crayons or yeah. 13,152 number two pencils. Speaking of which, I think it's time to start donating boxes of number 666 pencils to local schools. <laughs> yeah, we'll get them number twos, but label them with the 666 Yeah, for there you sure. go. Yeah, we could get that yeah, made. It's just one big thick pencil. Yeah. <laughs> now, to be clear... It may be that the district has a policy against accepting direct donations, but if that's the case, why not make that clear in the response, right? Especially given the bigoted protesting that accompanied the event. And even setting all that aside, the tone deafness of suggesting a goddamn Christian ministry for the donation is inexcusable. Now, for their part, the Satanic Temple is still trying to give away that money, offering it instead to the local teachers union and individual principals and teachers with the district until somebody will take their filthy devil money. Right. And in the meantime, literally every time that district asks for money or a teacher has to bob for apples so they can have crayons or something, someone should be sending this article in response. Yeah. yeah what a, they could just. Get, all right. Yeah, we'll give it back to ourselves. We're a local service organization. Now, here's the money again. What yes. The fuck. <laughs> And in Dover reaction news. Nice. There was a terrorist <laughs> attack here in the UK recently. You might not have heard about it because, first of all, nobody was killed. And secondly, the attack took place at a centre for housing and processing migrants. And according to most of the current, current government, none of those people in there who were targeted are technically people, so yeah. you don't care about them. <sighs> no, our, our, our country's collective conservative paranoia about immigrants is pretty much the same. You have to swap out the word caravan for flotilla now and again, but otherwise it's in, interchangeable. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But yeah, on, the, on Sunday, the 30th of October, a 66-year-old man called Andrew Leake set fire to the migrant centre in Dover with some crudely made petrol bombs before taking his own life. And to nobody's surprise, Leake was motivated by far-right ideology and his Facebook page was absolutely filled with rants about Muslim grooming gangs who only target Christian children and about how a quarter of a million Christian children are abused every single year. Okay, the thought process required to make up that conspiracy theory is insane because it includes, okay, you guys agree the most desirable kids to fuck would be 
Christian, right? We all agree. And then <laughs> the, a room full of people were like, yeah, it would be Christian. Like if you were a pedophile, if you were a Muslim yeah, pedophile. Absolutely. Oh, of course, of course. Okay. I hope M Michael Marshall isn't a part of this telegram. So I'm, I'm writing that down. That's locked in. Great. Just a lot of people getting their tables out and looking at their rankings that they've been working <laughs> so, on yeah. for, for some time. Yeah. <laughs> His Facebook page also included paranoid warnings about the dangers of the COVID vaccine and the, quote, hidden pandemic of abortion in the UK. OK, so I can't speak to that, but don't worry, Andrew. Politicians in Florida are hard at work in get, uh, getting that number of abused children up to a more acceptable level for you. <laughs> right, right. So eventually, posting white Christian nationalism rhetoric and religious tinged tribalism to social media wasn't enough for Leak. And so he decided to go out and try and kill some Muslims. And don't get me wrong, I am absolutely no defender of Islam. I think as a religion, its ideas are factually incorrect about the origin and moral structure of the universe, and its prescriptions can at best only serve as an obstacle to a happy and well-adjusted life. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't protect its followers from this kind of targeted attack. Yeah, yeah. I, we, we don't like the Hunger Games novels either, but we don't fireball okay. its fans at book releases. Listen, <laughs> listen, Katniss Everdeen is the Jane Eyre of our time. I've said that many oh, times. Okay. <laughs> I don't even know what you're trying to say. It's a ridiculous oh. example. <laughs> I would rather you be a Muslim, Heath, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I'm also not naive enough as to think that this was an attack on Islam as a religion. Right. Because Andy Leake wasn't trying to have a theological debate about the nuances of the diverging Abrahamic traditions. And he didn't set out to destroy Islam with facts and reason. He tried to destroy Muslims with homemade incendiary devices. His motivation here was not a liturgical disagreement. It was racist extremism. Right. But luckily, racist extremism goes hand in hand with being an idiot, so he just threw a bunch of Molotov cocktails in a back porch and then killed himself. Honestly, given who that guy was, it might have been a net good afternoon for him. Have yeah, considered this? and for us, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, no. I was just thinking, like, I mean, I wish our anti-immigrant bigots would set porches on fire and then kill themselves. I want that more than I want your health care system, man. <laughs> Let's get him a trolley and a track if they're going to do that with it. That's yeah. great. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> But here's the thing, none of his increasingly unhinged rhetoric set off any red flags at all. At the time that he carried out this attack, he wasn't even on the radar of the counter-terrorism police because that kind of language directed at Muslims and directed at Islam is just so routine that it's almost completely unremarkable. And it gets a complete pass because of the increasingly dehumanizing language from those in power when it comes specifically to <sighs> immigrants from Muslim-majority countries. Cool, right. cool, cool. So terrorists are getting protected by the fucking BitTorrent model. That's what's happening <laughs> on the internet. Yeah. Just yeah. millions of people being like, I am hate crime Spartacus on the internet. Fuck, <laughs> that's working? Yeah, it absolutely is, because in the same week as this attack, the Home Secretary, the person in charge of immigration, Suella Braveman, told Parliament that the Southern Coast of the UK is undergoing, quote, an invasion of migrants. Jesus Christ. An invasion at the time that Ukraine is under undergoing a, an invasion. She compared mm -hmm. the migrants arriving on the South Coast to that. And the Spectator magazine, the supposed respectable face of the British right wing, ran imagery in one of their articles of a wave of heavily racialized immigrants arriving on the Beach, and it would not have looked out of place this imagery in Germany in the 1930s. Nope. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No, it would be great if there was a little more space between terrorist manifesto and parliamentary address, but no. <laughs> right. <sighs> and so this was not a religiously motivated attack. This was a racist attack. He wasn't trying to kill Islam, he was trying to kill brown people. But the reason he got there is because there were plenty of people obscuring their stoking of racial divides with religious language. And without theological differences to hide behind, they'd have to be much more open about the fact that their objections to immigrants aren't based on creed, but on color. Yeah, well said. Bigot torrent. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> we found it. Obviously. That's the model. <laughs> and in Buddhist booze dist news tonight, United Airlines agreed to pay a $305,000 settlement to a former pilot this week after trying to force him to be a Christian and then firing him when he resisted. No, to be clear, I phrased that in an intentionally incendiary way, and there are several steps that I left out, but that sentence that I just said was factually correct. See, the pilot in question, David Disbro, is a Buddhist, but he was grounded after being diagnosed with a substance abuse problem, and as a prerequisite to keeping his job, United insisted that he go through AA, an explicitly Christian 12-step program. When he asked if he could use a Buddhist-oriented program instead, they said no and fired him. 
Here's a list of magic themed programs that we consider to be accredited. You got to pick one of these off this list. That's what they said. And they're like, we're in charge of flying airplanes through the sky. Is yeah, our job. over cities. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, Buddhist AA, where you give up all desires and alcohol is just kind of included in it. That's a little simplistic for me. I don't know. It's just a one step. So no, I personally, like I put Alcoholics Anonymous in the same category as the Salvation Army in the extent to which like they benefit from people not realizing how religious those organizations are. Right. But AA is super de do pretty religious it is a 12 step program where step one is people who don't believe in God suck. And step two is therefore believe in God. So it, not a really welcome place for an atheist or a non theist like Dispro. It also didn't help that the AA group that they assigned them to met in a Christian church. It's so crazy. Like seven of the 12 steps of the 12 step program are about belief in God. And yet the AA gets recommended by like doctors and the NHS in the UK and stuff. Yeah. It's like finding out that step one of your colonoscopy was involving a sacrifice to Baphomet first. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what that juice they make you drink the night before is called, but what happens next? (laughs) Definitely satanic, Mark. I promise you that it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so, so Dispro attended a meeting. He realized it didn't sit right, right with his uh, religious convictions. And then he got online to see what the alternatives were. Now, luckily for him, there was a perfect substitute available. There's a program called Refuge Recovery that operated in his area and catered to Buddhists. So he asked his bosses if he could go to that instead of, you know, accepting the truth of a higher power. And they said no, which is fucking nuts. So naturally, Dispro sued because, you know, you're not allowed to force your employees to be Christian unless you're a church, in which case you're literally allowed to force your employees to do any goddamn thing you want. Fun. And because there was no fucking way United was going to prevail in court, they settled. Okay, I'm just picturing this guy rolling back into the United Terminal with a pilot suit made of their money that he cashed, just <laughs> pretending to be drunk, being like, yeah, fire me again, fire me again. I can do this all year, all <laughs> year, fire me again. So yeah, so this story does have a happy ending. The dude was awarded just over $300,000 in back pay. He was allowed to rejoin the recovery program and get back on track to get his license reinstated. And United changed their policy so that this option would be available to future pilots in their addiction recovery program, which is admittedly disturbing in so much as it underscores the fact that, oh shit, this pilot's been drunk the whole time is such a common problem that they have an entire like program established for it. But it is good news for religious freedom. Uh, the the real kind, not the bullshit that Republicans keep trying to sell us as religious freedom. And in Qatar hero news. Nice. We're going to talk about something other than the midterms now. Good. We're talking about football, the real one, not the American one. But don't <laughs> worry. It's still about bigots with way too much power. So you're not going to get the bends or anything listening to this <laughs> podcast because this week in an interview about how welcoming Qatar planned on being when hosting the World Cup this month, World Cup ambassador and former footballer Khalid Salman said homosexuality is a, quote, damage in the mind. Fuck your face. Well, to be clear, though, he only means that insult wise, right? Because like you wouldn't have a law against schizophrenia, right? So he only means that in the sense that it lessens the rights of LGBTQ people. Yeah. And then right after he said damage in the mind. Salmon got slide tackled by a World Cup press officer and pulled out of the camera area. I'm glad they stopped letting him talk, but why the fuck did they start letting him talk? What did they think was going to happen? They thought he was going to give a surprise, enlightened hot take on the sodomy laws they have in Connor? (laughs) Get the fuck out of here. (laughs) Yeah. So for those of you who aren't familiar, FIFA made the controversial decision to let Qatar host the World Cup this year from uh, mid-November until about early December. And Pretty much since the second they made that decision, there have been problems, right? From worries about visitors being forced to follow Qatar's strict Sharia law to literal slaves being used to build stadiums and other facilities. And for the most part, Qatar has done a tremendous amount of fucking hand-waving around these reasonable objections, right? They've employed accusations of racism and absurd arguments that basically boil down to, yeah, but you don't make the French bathe when they host the World (laughs) Cup, so you shouldn't make us treat women like people. Right, yeah, no, you're oppressing our oppression. That's twice as bad. (laughs) We're bigot bigots? Okay, okay, you're a bigot, bigot, bigot. Your move now, Mr. (laughs) Solomon. You want to keep playing this game? Yeah. Oh, that's dumb? Bigot, you're bigot. It's just that. 
Right. So in the interview, Salman, and I can't emphasize this enough, apropos of fucking nothing, said, quote, let's talk about gays. The most important thing is everybody will accept that they come here, but they will have to accept our rules, end quote. Oh, and then he added that he was concerned children might learn, quote, something that is not good, end quote. Uh, yeah, no, their official policy is be gay. Just don't be all gay about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh. So if you're wondering what FIFA's response to this very obvious statement of, yes, we're going to do homophobia was, well, apparently FIFA sent out a top secret confidential letter urging the nations participating in the 2022 World Cup to, quote, focus on football, end quote, when the tournament kicks Don't off. Don't do the gay sex like you were planning. Just do the football. Yeah, or or even better, you know, slavery schmavery. I think England's team is looking great this yeah, year. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh-huh. Yeah. And on that note, we're going to close the headlines off. Heath, Eli, and occasionally Marsh. Thanks as always, and or sometimes. Jumanji. And when we come back, it'll turn out that we've also been stockpiling vulgarity for charity roasts. Hey, folks, just cutting in with a quick reminder that you still have time to donate to Vulgarity for Charity. We've already raised over a quarter of a million dollars, but the fundraiser doesn't end until midnight on Thanksgiving. So you still have time to help us reach our goal of three hundred thousand dollars. And don't forget, when you send in your roast, you can also request one of our special guest roasters because Marsh, Thomas, Andrew or Lucinda would be happy to insult your uncle, too. That's right, Noah. And for a limited time only, if you request me to do your roast, I'll also rip that motherfucker's head off. Uh uh, m- metaphorically, with her insult. Nope, with my bare fucking hand. No, so you see, now this is what I'm talking about, oh, Lucinda. Oh, we're just going to have this fight on the air. Then. You, you just get too aggressive in these things. I feel like the person making the request can decide if decapitation is too aggressive. No, no, there's a whole justice system for that, and they've already decided. Oh, again, with the laws. Yeah, yes, again, with the laws. Always with the laws. Fine. Anyway, be sure to get those donations in quick. That's modestneeds.org. Then send your receipt to vulgarityforcharity at gmail.com along with your roast request. And be sure to send a picture if that person isn't famous. Yeah. mm -hmm. And their schedule if you want their Ed Hay ipped Ray off a... No, no. Vulgarity for charity, because it only takes 16 pounds per square inch of pressure to crack a human skull. Damn it, Lucinda. What? That's just science. You do science on the show all the time. (laughs) the fundraiser portion of vulgarity for charity may be drawing to a close today but the insult portion is just getting ramped up and we were so overloaded with charitable vitriol last week that we couldn't even fit all the insults into one segment so in keeping with our slightly out of date theme this week tom and cecil will now suddenly be here for a little vulgarity for charity also already in progress All right, Noah, I got another one for you here. How about a roast for ex-Mormon Mike Norton? Yeah, no, I love it when the roasts are, you know, here's a guy who did some bad, some good. And if you want to understand the nuances, here are 23 pages of weeds (laughs) that you can scythe your way through. Fun. That's so true. So, Heath. Yeah. You mind helping me keep tally here? Yeah, yeah, no problem. I got it. Okay, so apparently this guy was a Mormon. Bad. But then quit. Good. And took on an internet gnome de plume with the first name Noah. Bad. Hey. Bad. Yeah, bad. He he uploaded sacred Mormon ceremonies to YouTube. Good. And almost made a porn in a Mormon temple. Really good. Okay. Yeah, extra we good. like that. Yeah. But then good. decided against it. Boo, bad. Uh, what? Boo, extra bad. Extra bad for chickening out. He spends a lot of time on Reddit. <laughs> bad. Where he's managed to rile up a lot of Mormon leadership. Good. Okay. But also allegedly spends time on TikTok. Good. That is good. A lot no, of people fine. Don't know. no, fine. Okay. Where he sent unsolicited dick pics to a bunch of Exmo TikTokers. Bad. He also once helped a sexual assault survivor beat the Mormon church in court. Okay, good. But then later publicly threatened to shoot her in the head. What? what? Man, dude, bad. Okay. Okay, so so where does that leave us? That that was six good, six bad. Dead even. Dead even. Oh. Uh, oh, uh, here's a picture of his mustache. Bad Very mustache. bad, yeah. Good, okay. And Cecil, <laughs> <laughs> I have a pet for you this time. Oh. John donated 200 bucks for you to roast his pet rabbit, Titus. 
They want this pat rabbit Titus to get bigger. So this is for you, Titus. Look, you little shit. They don't want a thumper. They want a plumper. They want a four-car <laughs> garage your rabbit. That's what they want. They want, you to, they want you to eat so much you have breathing problems and transform into Pugs Bunny. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> a, yes. a word of warning here, Titus. There are a couple of ways to stuff a rabbit, so I would do this fucking voluntarily if I were you. <laughs> a four-car garage your rabbit is the best thing I've ever heard. I'm All right. I'm going to work that into so many conversations just aggressively. <laughs> it's not going to make sense. Yep. Uh, it's going to find the way in though. But it'll always be welcome. Pugs Bunny makes me so happy right now. <laughs> All right. So I have a tricky one for you here, Heath. Seb donated $150 for you to roast the lettuce that outlasted Liz Truss. Okay. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> I, I like that. That lettuce was a touch shard on Liz about the oh, whole thing. Right. <laughs> and so was the media. Always giving her a negative spin, itching to criticize her, <laughs> inflating every problem to biblical proportions. <laughs> but her policies had no chance, no matter what. They were bad, but they had no chance. To be fair to Liz, oh. Boris Johnson handed her a mess clinically, destroying the economy. <laughs> budget, clinically. Are we going to stand there and tell me that's her <laughs> fault? <laughs> British companies were underwater, uh, press fallen, and failing already. <laughs> for her to remain in office for more than six weeks <laughs> as the head of state was a ridiculous expectation. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. ridiculous the situation yes. was grotesque. Girl was impossible to succeed at. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been thinking. Uh, we should leave her alone and treat her better. <laughs> it's important. I'm switching from the dogs thing. He has to do that now. He, I am standing on my chair. Oh, captain, my captain. Right now. Oh, captain, my captain. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Um, but it's all lettuce puns. Le listener, I expect that you should go back about 90 seconds. Listen to that again. Make sure you got all of it. Yeah. It's so good. All right. Eli, you're up next. Will gave us $77.77 to roast his sister-in-law, Allie. Will, I'm going to go ahead and say it. I don't think it's very nice for you to have me roast Allie. And I'm going to tell you why. Because you sent me a picture of Allie with your wife, who is, if you'll forgive me, smoking fucking hot. And Allie looks like if instead of a videotape, the ring curse had been on an Ann Taylor catalog. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Right. See, in this photo, they're doing the, like, let's hold our hands up to the sun photo. And your wife is beaming because this is one of the many lovely vacations she'll have in her life. And Allie is just standing there like a death row prisoner, aware that she's literally fucking invisible right now. If she had a thought <laughs> bubble, it would be, I could walk into a bank vault and just start loading up my shapeless black top with stacks of cash right now. Oh, they're going to put it. me in the wrong head of trash bag when I die. <laughs> How dare you do this to her, Will? <laughs> wow. All right. So I love this one, Tom. Alex would like a roast for people who pick through wood in the lumber aisle. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Look, to a degree, I get it. A two by four costs so much at this point, framing out a wall requires a second mortgage. You don't want to spend your money on studs that are more warped than Eli's sexual fantasies. Hey. Okay. You don't, but it's not picking through that's the problem. I, I've been to the lumber store, I have watched. Carhartt dude bros sight down the length of a piece of wood for curves and then reject the board by throwing the rejected piece into the <laughs> aisle or just like hucking it randomly on top of other pieces of wood. What the shit is wrong with you, you entitled fucking construction Karens? You're the first fucking guys to whine and bitch and moan about how the trades and manual labor don't get enough credit. And look, I'm right there with you, but fucking hell, you are not helping your cause. And I know, I know with all the certainty in my heart that if I followed you outside, you'd load your precious, bespoke, selected, artisanal fucking arrow straight lumber into a white pickup with tinted windows and some vinyl corporate brand or dumb fucking slogan that you can't distinguish from having your own personality. <laughs> and someday, someday. When your back aches all the time and your knees are shot and you can't hoist that beer gut you've been meticulously cultivating for four decades into the obscenely lifted cab of your oversized truck, I know too that everyone in your life will have long ago looked 
sighted down the broken, stupid length of you and judged you <laughs> laughing. And you too will have been unlovingly and unceremoniously discarded as being too fucking worthless to bother with. <laughs> nice. All right, enough of the personal. Let's get conceptual. For example, Benjamin asked for a roast of mental illness. And as the most mentally fit person on this podcast, I'll take the lead on that one. <laughs> Listen, mental illness, I get you've been working a lot of overtime lately. So I hate to just now tell you this, but you're wasting your fucking time. Right? Like so heart disease, I get. Right? Because it takes a lot to take down a heart. Hearts are powerful, relentless machines that pump 2,000 gallons of blood every day. But brains? They're already fucked up without your help. <laughs> we could be death obsessed, anxiety riddled, sexually confused, hyperactive, ill tempered messes without you. Fuck, man. If I want to remember why I walked into every room I walked into, I would have to write that shit on my hands. Right. <laughs> and, that, and that's when my brain is at peak performance. Brains are the Florida gators of organs. And that's the one you attack. <laughs> Stop bringing sand to the goddamn beach. <laughs> <laughs> Since Noah ranked who is most mentally ill, I'd just like to chime in to say that like when we were rated by attractiveness, I dislike how in last place I am again. <laughs> I just want to throw it out there. I would like to be first in some rankings. <laughs> All right, Heath. Daniel would like you to roast conservatism. Okay, good pick, Daniel. Conservatism doesn't even mean what that word means at this point. Conservatives love to talk about, like, oh, I'm just a simple man who likes a good ear of corn and some sweet tea. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Nobody's running a progressive campaign to cancel corn and tea. <laughs> it's the Klan meeting happening next to the corn and tea, you fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the fact that being conservative is the political philosophy of a child cheating at a game. You were born on third base and, and then you gerrymandered home plate to be touching thirds. So you actually got <laughs> born ahead by a run artificially. And now you're saying the entire game is over because the other team persecuted you by trying to start the second inning. You're playing one round of musical chairs and then you're shitting on your chair and refusing to move for round two. Conservatism is the going limp and shitting yourself of politics. Go fuck yourself. All right, Tom, here's one that I know is right up your alley. How about a roast of restaurants that serve small plates for Patrick? Okay, actually, the roast request is small plates for sharing. Ugh. And I'm sorry, but... No, absolutely not. Like, I didn't go to a fucking restaurant so I could have a small plate. Right? <laughs> I am at the restaurant to eat, not to have some conceptual fucking cock tease about what it might be like to share the scent of a roasted beet with a friend. Tom, I love you so much right now. Small plates are appetizers with better marketing and higher markup. Yep. Why the fuck would I want to make reservations to spend my time and money leaving the restaurant hungry what, <laughs> to have an experience? I already had the experience of being hungry, you shit for brains, <laughs> and I went to your restaurant to get rid of it. <laughs> an experience. How fucking bougie are we? Eating has to be rebranded as a goddamn experience. Stubbing my toe is an experience. I'm not selling tickets or taking reservations <laughs> for it. I'm at your goddamn restaurant because I'm hungry. And don't get me wrong, I'm paying to have a good time, but I'm paying to have a good time eating. Small fucking <laughs> plates is like sex with two condoms and your pants on. It's an experience, but it sure as fuck isn't satisfying. <laughs> Stubbing your small toe. There you go. <laughs> is that better? Tom is not amused by this boo shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I have a bit of a challenge for you, Cecil. Aaron would like a roast of cancer as a concept. Oh, what? Wow. Oh, cool. I got small what plates and wiggly lumber. <laughs> 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 no kidding, right? <laughs> fucking small plates any day. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Okay. How, how do you roast fucking cancer? It defies metaphor. What am I going to say? It's like signing up for a charity dunk tank, but they ran out of water and replaced it with polar bears. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like your partner going down on you and not mentioning that their dentures were a bear trap. It's like someone replacing your Folgers crystals with radium. Like, fucking, what the fuck, man? Look, cancer. Here's the thing, cancer. I will say one thing. 
every single person stuck with you is way fucking tougher than you'll ever be. Fuck cancer. Amen. Strong. And Eli, Fra Paul, and yes, I do appreciate the anathem reference, would like you to roast Heath's, shall we say, surprise changes to the citation needed format. <laughs> hey, hey, Heath. I love this roast. Hold on, hold on. I love this roast. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Is this when I asked you guys a question instead of me giving a summary? Yes. Okay. It's, it it's more than that, but One yeah, time? go ahead. Yeah. Okay. No, it's fine. It's, it's like multiple times. Heath? You know when you start a job as a bartender and there's that one manager who's like very specific about the rules and how he likes things done. And then two weeks into that job, someone's like, oh, Chris, he's not a manager. That's you. That's you, Keith. I've been putting lemons in the ice bucket. I'm cutting wedges on a slant for you. And you just work here. Like me. Like me. You just work here. But I've been doing it. But you know what? You're going to get fired just like that manager does <laughs> when everyone finds out your new girlfriend is 16. So, okay. <laughs> that's on you, Bookaroo. Oh, boy. what is happening? That's a good turn. <laughs> <laughs> sure. All right. Just because jokes are dead, let me clarify. Heath is not dating a 16-year-old. Thank you. Because <laughs> I do know one person. Eli, I'm concerned. Oh my God. Yeah, no, you don't have to worry about that. Heath doesn't like labels. He would never have a girl. <laughs> he would never say he was wow. dating. Her. I like numbers, wow. though. I keep track of <laughs> numbers. Jesus. <laughs> All right, so back to people. Heath, let's start with you. Penny wants you to roast J.D. Vance. Love it. Okay, well, Such a um, good pick. J.D. Vance is a Republican. <laughs> oh, right, I'll do more. more. I'll do more. more, but I feel like that should be enough. Yeah. He wrote his memoirs. His memoirs at age 32. Memoirs! <laughs> Don't fuck yourself. And the book is called Hillbilly Elegy. It's the sad lament of a white guy going to Yale and becoming a venture capital millionaire. Yep. <laughs> Just heart-wrenching tale, oldest time. It's also about <laughs> hillbillies from his native Ohio having no power anymore and how they'd, you know, never be able to elect... Uh, for example, J.D. Vance to be their senator. It's very <laughs> tragic stuff. Also, he looks like a teacup pig got fucked by the blockchain. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> also, you're not a fucking hillbilly if you're from Ohio. Okay, the, the highest point in Ohio is a goddamn fucking roller coaster. It's Cedar Point. Garbage yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Cecil, this next one's for you. Brett would like a roast for his wife, Christina, of her dad... Dan and her new stepmom, Lily. Okay. Lily looks like someone who was a former corporate go getter who snapped and started a spiritual wellness website. Oops, sorry. Nope. That's literally the description of her. I'm just reading <laughs> the description. I was planning on insulting her. And then I just figured I'd read that out loud. She looks, she looks like the final boss in a PTA themed video game. Like her hair looks like someone went into the salon with a troll doll and asked for the Karen, you know? And your dad, your dad, I'll roast your dad here real quick. He looks like he was desperate enough to marry Lily. <laughs> Okay, Noah, this one's for you because if we're going to make Heath roast dogs, you know, yeah. like Jorge, it's only fair that you take on a couple of cats here. So in that spirit, Jeremy would like you to roast his cats. Amazing name, by the way, Cloak and Dagger. Yeah. So, okay, bro, it's not that Dagger is a timid little scaredy cat just as a personality. It's that his brother is a manipulative psychopath cat. <laughs> <laughs> and Dagger is just constantly looking out for that demonic hell beast. Just look into Cloak's eyes, man. That is the way Hannibal Lecter would look at you if he was a cat and stupid. <laughs> Your mom didn't so much abandon them as she made the calculated decision to get away from Cloak while he was still too small for his little feet to follow her. Okay, here's hoping that you at least hear this fucking insult before Cloak slits your throat in your sleep. <laughs> All right. So, Eli, in an astounding display of poor judgment and bad parroting that I'm sure will come up in therapy, if not a divorce hearing, James assures us that his 12-year-old son, Gavin, wants nothing more, oh, you're going to regret this, than for you to roast him. Okay. Yikes. <laughs> All right, Gavin, look, I don't have a roast for you. Just some life advice. Okay, kid? You, just hear me out, you... Do not have to worry about pedophiles. Oh my okay. God. Okay. <laughs> look, your parents are going to have a lot of safety advice. 
Don't <laughs> ride in cars with strangers. Jesus. Don't follow a guy into an alley who says he has a puppy. Jesus you, Christ. Gavin, you're fine. <laughs> Fuck you can actually do those do things. <laughs> it's safe. <laughs> What I'm saying, Kevin, what I'm saying is no, even six beers in at closing time at Chuck E. Cheese, you are, you are fine. Go visit Uncle Epstein on his wow. island. You're going to have a blast. Water slide. Is it too late to back out of this? Is it too late? Uh, Mom and Dad, here's a quick alternate roast in case you don't want to have to explain things to CPS. Uh, Kevin. <laughs> You look like the sequel to E.T. if E.T. had been a love story. You can ask the parents what that means and they'll explain it to you. All right, Tom. Cassie donated $250 for you to roast Worthington, Pennsylvania. You know, Worthington, Pennsylvania is small town America in a nutshell. That is not a compliment. Small town America is full of small ideas and the small shitty people who think them. Small town America hasn't gotten out much and is proud of it. Celebratory of its ignorance because that ignorance is all that it has to offer. Worthington is the perfect exemplar of the singular stupidity and meanness embodied by every nothing town nobody would remember if the earth itself swallowed it whole. Worthington is a cuck town, a town that wants to watch <laughs> because it lacks the balls to engage. Worthington and every Hicksville nothing town with the same energy and different name wants nothing more than to raise their stupid fists in solidarity with their own greedy, backward pointlessness. Worthington, Pennsylvania welcomes fascism with the open arms of every dumb shit redneck who failed history class and wants to teach you what it means to be a patriot. The kind of trash city nothingsville, USA, where everybody knows everybody, not because the town is small, but because the people are. <laughs> Well done. Yeah, they got a Dollar General, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Dollar General. I, I don't know why I didn't include that. I should have put they had a yeah. dollar. Waffle House, probably. <laughs> yep, probably. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got to abruptly stop there because this is sliced out of a larger segment. So, Tom, Cecil, thanks so much for being here. And please respond with the exact words, tone, and cadence that you used when I thanked you last week. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, man. And if we didn't get to your roast yet, don't worry. We're just getting started. There are plenty more insults to come. And thanks once again for everybody who helped make Bulgarity for Charity such a resounding success again this year. Before we sit way back, unbutton our pants and go, ah. Tonight, I want to thank everybody one last time for making Vulgarity for Charity such a success over the years. Nothing makes me prouder than seeing what this community can do when it's called upon to help. You give me so much to be thankful for. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our half-sister show's Hot Tasting Day, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, the thermometer can't pop out of this turkey until I thank Heath Enright for always stuffing so much humor into the episode. I need to thank Eli Bosnick for being such a ham. I need to thank Lucy and delusions for her deviled excellence. I want to thank Cecil for being so corny. And I want to thank Tom for, for, um, for being mashed potatoes. Sorry, bro. I was, I was stretching it by Lucinda, obviously. I also need to thank John for providing this week's Fires with Code. And if you need more skeptical audio drama in your life, be sure to check the show notes for a link to Universe 25. Oh, and incidentally, Several of you wrote in to take issue with last week's Farnsworth quote. Many of you thought it promoted violence specifically against helpless people. Uh, it was a promotion for a YouTube channel that used gag violence for humorous purposes. But when I listened back over it, I could see like why that wasn't obvious to everyone. Anyway, the Farnsworth quote was removed from that episode once I saw the reaction. So sorry about that. And thanks to everybody who wrote in to tell me that you weren't comfortable with it. Anyway, back to the formula. Most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best people. Ada, Danielle, Atheist Stuck in the Bible Belt, Christopher, Jeffrey, Ben, Taylor, Maddie, Goat, and Tegan. Ada, Daniel, and Bible Belt Atheist, who are so cool people accidentally spoon them onto pumpkin pie. Christopher, Jeffrey, and Ben, who are so sexy when it says bring a dish, it means to ask them to come. And Taylor, Maddie, Goat, and Tegan, who are so hot the turkey thermometer just pops out whenever they get near it. Together, these nine refined doubters of the divine were inclined to reassign some financial instruments our way by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give some to us, but if you do, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash scathing atheist, whereby you learn access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the 
the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but not for money, you wouldn't. You can also help a ton by telling a friend about the show, leaving a five-star review, and following us on just social media in general. Incidentally, we're on Mastodon now, at P-I-A-T-Pod, at Mastodon.world, if you're interested. Legal services of this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Martin Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Sorry for the lack of outtakes. We'll try to do worse next time. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.